the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean. <coughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, now and from the age of all ages, I mean. About five years ago, there was a study published by a mathematician um, from some university in Massachusetts. And the title of the study was The Hipster Effect When Anti-Conformists All Look the Same. So, uh, a little bit of background, a hipster is someone who doesn't want to conform. A hipster is someone who doesn't uh, like what everybody else is doing and wants to do their own thing. So they feel like, you know, society is just uh, all Starbucks and uh, well, what are those uh, water bottles that everybody has? And Stanley's. No, no, I want to do my own thing. I'm not going to follow the crowd. I'm not going to buy that stuff. I'm not going to do this kind of stuff. I'm going to do my own thing because I'm not, I don't conform. I don't just follow blindly, mindlessly. I do my own thing. So what this uh, mathematician looked into was the question of why, after a period of time, all the hipsters start looking the same. The people who set out to, to want to do their own thing, to, uh, to want to be different, to want to stand apart and to want to show that they don't follow the crowd, they end up becoming like everyone else who wants to stand out and not follow the crowd. So they all end up looking the same. He says you, uh, they all look more or less identical, the exact opposite of the countercultural kind of impulse that's motivating this whole movement. There is a process of synchronization where they synchronize. And this is important. They all kind of begin to think the same, talk the same, dress the same, make the same kinds of choices in food, uh, in entertainment, all sorts of things. A process of synchronization. At the beginning, things to be random and things to begin, it seemed like everybody's doing their own thing. But after a short period of time, eventually, everybody else starts looking exactly the same. And he studied why this delay happens, and he was left with some questions as to why exactly it happens and how long it takes. But what was unmistakable is after some period of time, everybody starts looking the same, synchronization. And when his study was published, a magazine picked up the study and published an article on it and put a picture of someone who fits that kind of look, a hipster. And someone who was reading the article uh, sent a message to the editor, to the publisher of the article, and said that um, they used the, an, a, that image of him without his consent, without his permission, and uh, they used it to prove some half-baked theory and something that's not true and not provable, and they have no journalistic ethics, and he threatened uh, to pursue legal action against them. So, the publication immediately panicked and went to the source of where they got the picture and confirmed that they have got all the rights to use the picture and that in fact it's not the same person as the one complaining. So they responded in a Twitter and they said that the guy who threatened to sue us for misusing his image wasn't the one in the photo. He misidentified himself, all of which just proves the story we, we ran. So he sends a, an email, kind of apology. He says, wow, I stand corrected. I guess I and multiple family members and a childhood friend pointed it out to me. We all thought it's a mildly photo, photoshopped picture of me. I even have very similar hat and shirt. Um, so everyone thought, he thought it was him, his family, his friends, everybody thought it was him. That's how closely everyone looked. And if you come here on a Friday night and walk into the youth meeting, you see this synchronization in full effect. All the boys, all of them, they all have the same haircut, the same shoes, um, different colors of the same pattern shirt, and, <clears throat> and synchronize. We all synchronize. V you know, it, it's scary how, um, how real this 
um, this thing is. The lady, the woman that came today, she came in repentant. And she confessed her sins for everyone. And she, anointed, she uh, wept and she kissed the feet of Christ. And Christ accepted her, her repentance. But he told her, go. Because if you stay, then nothing changes. You're going to go back to whatever it is you started out with. Nothing will change. For us, sometimes we think that if I set purity as a goal, then this is all I need to worry about. I just need to focus on how I achieve that goal. I want to be pure. I want to be righteous. I want to be holy. This is the goal I want to achieve. And then I go about trying to figure out how do I achieve this goal. But we forget one small detail. Whenever you watch any sports game, both teams have the same goal. Everybody, everybody wants to win. They all have the same goal, but only one of them gets to win. And the thing about goals is that achieving goals is a momentary change. It kind of discounts the process towards achieving the goal. And the whole focus becomes about achieving the goal. And the problem is that once I achieve the goal, I stop trying. Once I achieve whatever it is I set as my goal, if I want purity, you know, however I define that goal, then once I achieve it, I stop trying. And as soon as I stop trying, I get back into the same habits. I get back into the same pattern of behavior. I go back into the same environment and I synchronize to that environment. So today, our Lord tells this woman, go, leave. If you stay here, nothing will change. You're going to go back. You need to leave to keep that, whatever it is I've given you, to keep that and move with it and, and run with it. You need to go. You need to leave. In confession, we often hear, we, we kind of have to work, to work together to kind of move away from focusing on outcomes to focusing on identity. We come thinking that I have a problem with anxiety. I don't want to feel anxious anymore. What do I need to do to not feel anxious? Is there a solution for anxiety? Is there uh, a thing that I can do, an exercise I can do, something I can do to reduce anxiety? But focusing on the outcome is very short term and its effect is very limited. It's not about the outcome, it goes deeper than that. It goes all the way down to identity. Who do I see myself as? And based on how I answer this question, then we begin to see about how I live my life and the outcomes and the behaviors that I want to focus on and I want to change. It's a two-step process. Decide what kind of person you want to be and then prove it to yourself that this is the kind of person that I am with small wins, with small steps, with a process. This woman did not wake up that day thinking that I'm going to go in front of everyone. I'm going to go in front of everyone in a place that's very hostile to me. A place that if I walk into, people will immediately want to kick me out. This environment is very hostile. And I'm going to go in there and I don't care. And I'm going to sit right in front and center, right by Christ himself. I'm not going to sit in some corner hidden from view. No, I'm going to sit right in the middle in this hostile environment. And I'm going to do the one thing. The one thing that's considered taboo by everyone. I'm going to, I'm going to touch his feet. And they told him, like, how can you allow someone unclean to touch you? Because for them, these ritual purity laws, they take very seriously. If you come in contact with anything unclean, anyone unclean or someone in an unclean state, and like someone who has disease, for example, if, they have, if someone is diseased, they have, there's a certain precautions they have to take and they have to live outside of the city for a certain number of, of days. And then they present themselves to the priest before they're allowed access back to their home and being admitted back to the community. So this is a person considered unclean. So to touch someone in that state, for example, is, is a problem, right? So she goes in there and she does all of these things. 
it's not just a spur of the moment kind of action. There are a lot of things that led to this. There are a lot of steps that were taken as a process that was taken that started long ago and that had led her to this moment to act in the way she acted. But how does this help us? See, the environment that we live in, we all synchronize to it. We become who we hang out with. We become where and what we, we do. So if we want to be repentant, we have to see and examine and do a kind of uh, an audit of our environment to see if there are things in the environment, if there are cues in our environment, things that trigger an action, things that uh, make us want, for example, like if I'm trying to fast and there's all this fatari food around, how long am I going to stay fasting? Oh, I'm going to try and it's going to be very difficult. And even if I manage to stay fasting, my mind is all, all going to be about food, thinking about food, thinking about all the food I'm not having, and I'm going to have a miserable time. Right? This is just one example. But doing an audit of our environment, what kind of things and what kind of people and what kind of setup do I have in my environment that uh, translates into kind of action and translates into kinds of habits that either I want to have or I don't want to have. So the way to make, to make this work is that for something good, for something good, I want to make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy and make it satisfying. Again, make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, and make it satisfying. And if I want to get rid of a bad habit, make it invisible, the opposite of the four. Make it unattractive, make it difficult, and make it unsatisfying. This woman in that environment, there were a lot of elements that were bad for her. A lot of elements that triggered cues, cravings, that triggered kind of responses, that were harmful, that were unhealthy, that were sinful, and she needed to change these things in the environment. And I'm not saying that you know, willpower has no role, but the environment, the effect of the environment is huge. Imagine I want to pray regularly. I want to read my Bible regularly. But my Bible, I put it far away, maybe on the second floor, maybe I put it you know, uh, in a box somewhere behind 10 other boxes. And every time I want to read the Bible, or I even think of reading the Bible, if I even think of it at all, I have to go through all of these steps. It's very difficult to go through all these steps just to find the Bible, just to read the Bible. And at the same time, imagine I put the Bible right front and center, right in front of me. So whenever I'm passing by, I'm always seeing the Bible. Right? When I make, it, when I make something so obvious, then it becomes easier and it becomes, I'm not going to say easy, but it becomes easier. It becomes this constant kind of reminder. There's a danger, of course, when something is like a constant reminder that I develop a sort of blindness to it. But it's much worse if I make it completely invisible. And in fact, it works in the opposite way. If I make something completely invisible, it kind of loses hold and loses the ability to, to kind of trigger responses from me. So... There was a bit of research done on this. And what they found is that disciplined people are better at structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower. Disciplined people often use self-control very little. They use self-control very little because they structured their lives in a way that it does not depend on heroic willpower, on me, you know, uh, pushing myself very hard not to do a, something that I don't want to do, not to commit a sin. Think, for example, smartphones. Smartphones make it so easy to kind of access anything, anywhere, at any time. Whenever you have a, a, a craving, you can satisfy this craving instantly, on demand, on the spot. This is kind of the opposite of what we're going for here. Right? If I'm struggling with something, if I'm struggling with a certain addiction, and I have instant access to it anytime, anywhere, imagine how difficult it will be to kind of stop this addiction, to treat this addiction, to move away from this addiction. 
versus if I make it so difficult to access whatever it is that I'm addicted to, right? Then it becomes so much easier to step away from this, to deal with this. There was a story about, and I think I told you that story before, about an assignment that a teacher gave in class. And a teacher told the students that you need to take the perfect picture. One group was allowed to take as many pictures as they wanted, but at the end of the day, they have to take a great picture, the best picture that they could possibly take. And the second group was only allowed to take one picture. Only one picture allowed. You're only allowed to snap you know, the camera once. That's it. And you have to take a great picture. So you have to really think about it and think about what you want to take and how you want to take it. And what ended up happening is that to everyone's surprise, or maybe, maybe not to everyone's surprise, but guess which group had the best picture? Or the best picture came out of which group? The group that took many pictures or the group that took one? The group that took many pictures ended up with the best picture because they, they had a chance to practice. Right? They took a picture and it didn't work, and they figured out what didn't work, and they took another picture, and then another, and another, and it got better and better and better at it. Versus the group that was uh, paralyzed by the fear of taking a bad picture. So they didn't take any pictures, and in, in fact, not only did they not take the best picture, they ended up taking no pictures, because they were so afraid of taking a picture that wasn't great. They were just waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and they were stuck waiting all this time. But if I really want to make something happen, go and go for it and try. And even if it doesn't work out perfectly, this woman today, she goes and she repents. And even if her repentance didn't work out perfectly, that wasn't going to stop her. Even if her sins were too great, that didn't stop her. Nothing stopped her. She went in there with just an open heart and she said, whatever happened, happens. I'm going to go and lay all my sins at the feet of Christ. All of them. I'm going to lay everything bare at the feet of Christ. And whatever he decides to do, he decides to do. I know what the people are going to do. I know how they're going to be judgmental. I know how they're going to be hostile. I know that they, if they could, they would just pick me up and throw me outside of the house. If they could, they would do that. But I don't care about any of that. All I care is, how is Christ going to react to me? So she went in there and she laid everything bare. And because she did this, she received something that no one in that, in that house received. She received justification. Christ told her, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. There's a little bit of a, a change of mindset kind of required for us to be able to take advantage of this. For us to be able to move forward with these good habits, to move forward with our ability to go to Christ with an open heart, with a heart that is repentant. Sometimes we think that all of our mistakes are kind of holding us back from Christ and saying like, I have to repent. But instead if we look at it in a different light, where it's not that I have to repent, but that I get to repent. I get to repent. Christ died on the cross to give me that gift, to give me the ability to repent, to stand up after I fall down. If I think of it this way, where I don't have, it's not that I have to repent, and it's such, such a burden. It's such a gift when I look at it as something that liberates me. It's like this one person who was uh, uh, bound to a wheelchair, was on, using a wheelchair from, uh, from birth. Like from birth, he wasn't able to walk and was using a wheelchair all his life. Not from birth, but all his life was using a wheelchair. And someone asked him, um, don't you find this kind of confining? And he said, no, if it wasn't for the wheelchair, I wouldn't be able to go anywhere. It's not confining, it's liberating. And that's exactly how this woman saw the repentance of Christ today. This ex she saw it as liberating, worth every sort of of obstacle that would possibly meet her. No matter what the Pharisees would say, no matter what anyone in that house said or looked or thought, none of it mattered to her. All that matters is the freedom that she got from the repentance that, uh, when, that, that Christ accepted, her repentance. They say the last mile is the least crowded. The last mile is the least crowded. It's very easy to kind of start on this journey. Very easy to have the motivation to take the first step. 
and it gets a bit more harder and challenging and it's the last mile in any race that's the least crowded because of all the people who had given up. But what we find out is that the more we try, the stronger we become and the easier that it becomes. And it becomes kind of like an obstacle only in our minds. An obstacle where the devil kind of feeds into it and tells us like, you know what, Christ will never accept this kind of repentance. Christ will never accept such a person. Christ will never accept such an act to go back from and to rise up from. And he would, tell, and he would try to convince us, to keep us down, to keep us from continuing the race, to keep us from continuing the journey with Christ towards repentance. The last mile is the least crowded. And this, this woman today, she took all of that last mile, not smile, the last mile in, in, uh, in confidence and in strength. And even though it was very difficult, even though there were all these obstacles, none of it mattered. All that matters is that I got to the feet of Christ. All that matters is that I was able to lay bare all of my sins at His feet. So today when we read this story, the story is about true victory and true conquering over this power of Satan to kind of hold us back. Or this power of Satan to kind of demotivate us and tell us that, you know what, You're, stay back, stay here. Here is comfortable, here is safe, here is predictable, you, you know where you are. But remember that if she had gone back to that same environment, even after Christ accepted her repentance, she would have gone back to that same way of life. She needed to go back and she needed to do kind of like an audit of her environment and figure out any of these bad elements, any of these bad habits and weed them out and replace them with good habits. Replace them with things that allow her to become the person that she became that day in Christ. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.